Hello, friends and audience. And we're going to continue the discussion that we had in the first video. And this is also available for download. And for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Brian Del Monte. I was your host in the first video, and I'm back again. Uh, just like in the last video, disclaimers. If you want to download this, you can read it in more detail. Bottom line, you'll have to work hard and have a bit of luck. This is not a get rich quick scheme. Okay, and so let's pick up where we left off. And this is the intermediate guide, so I'm going to presume you already understand about your audience, you understand the kingmaker thing, you understand that you have to invest yourself in them, and that you are prepared to do that. So, what do we, you know, what, what, what's this all ultimately about? When we talk about building an audience... What are we ultimately talking about? Well, what we're really talking about with an online business is email. It don't mean a thing if you ain't got that email. And I'm not being facetious in that regard. I'm very serious. I don't care how many Twitter followers you have. I mean, from time to time, I'll uh, be buying uh, media for myself or for a client, right? And it'll be, oh, so-and-so, I got 175,000 followers. Yeah, that's great. But with the exception of email, almost every other aspect of online life requires the recipient to take the action in order to initiate the contact. So whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, whatever... None of them are as strong in relationship building as email. Okay. And to illustrate that point, I've got this quote by Paul Buchheit. And probably you have no idea who this guy is. He's the inventor of Gmail. Okay. If you don't know who he is, he's the guy who invented Gmail. And he says, only my phone number and my email are private because I don't want random people calling me, but I like the ability to share everything. People guard their email because it's what they pay attention to. Okay, in order to build a relationship with somebody, there's really four factors. There's proximity, how often, or rather, how close are you to that individual? There's frequency, how often do they see you? Um, there's, uh, intensity. What is the, uh, 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 level of, uh, of interaction between the two of you and duration. And those four variables affect whether or not somebody is your friend or not. Okay. Are they close to you? Do you see them often? Do you have high intensity in terms of your interactions with them? And how long? does that interaction go? Now, depending on the situation, not all four of those variables are the same, but online, really the only vehicle that's going to allow you to, to interact on those four dimensions is email. Okay? And so that positions me differently than most of the world out there whose, you know, focus is traffic, 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 traffic. I got to get more and more and more traffic. And there's this endless focus on traffic, okay? Boost your traffic, get more traffic, get more traffic, get more traffic. Does more traffic actually build an audience? Yes and no but not in the way you think it does, okay? And I want to take a moment to discuss this myth of traffic, 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 traffic. You're not Budweiser, okay? And why do I start here by saying that? This traffic, traffic, traffic strategy largely is a consequence of digital marketers looking at how advertising agencies market brand products. Okay. And the problem with this traffic first strategy is that it doesn't acknowledge the fact that brands like 
Budweiser spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year on advertising. I believe, I'd have to look, I believe that Bud's online television is somewhere in the neighborhood of $600, $700 million. Okay? They spend, like, just $100 million on the playoffs in the NFL. Okay? Um, and, And why? Why do they do that? Okay, this constant churning of new people. Well, each time they run their ads and they generate more interest and they generate more uh, uh, awareness, they get a small conversion rate of new people and they keep lots of their old people. And so over time, this is a valid strategy because the numbers are huge. Okay, we're talking about a product that's basically can be sold to anybody and it's 100% brand driven. There's really no difference in the product of beer between beer brands. So the entirety of the advertising is not about, you know, hey, our beer with 20% more bubbles. I mean, that's not how it works. It's all about the brand. And so the digital advertisers and the digital marketers look at this, many times even subconsciously, and what they conclude is, well, I need an incremental strategy of marketing. But, you know, here, here's the reality. For all you do, no bud for you. You may think, well, I can just do this, but I'll do it at an incrementally lower level with smaller budget. And so I can build, 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 and build. Well, <laughs> again, that's not how any of this works. And so I don't want you to be depressed, but... Get ready to be super depressed. Research that's been done tells us that on average, only about 20% of the visitors that you ever drive to your traffic will ever return to your website. That's referral traffic, social traffic, search traffic, whatever. Okay, so 8 in 10 find your stuff. Maybe they engage with it. And then you're never going to see them again. That's pretty grim. But guess what? It gets worse. Further research tells us that you need on average five interactions with a prospective customer before they're going to make a purchase from you. And so... You take these two things together and this notion that, well, I can just do what Budweiser does but smaller, it falls apart really quickly. You know, a thousand visitors on your first visit turns into 200 visitors on your second visit and then 40 visitors on your third visit and eight visitors on your fourth visit and four visitors on your fifth visit. And now you can understand why the constant churn of generating traffic gets you so little result. Oh, and by the way, to make this even better, as soon as you stop advertising, the pipeline stops. So don't kid yourself. I mean, look, advertising works. If you really have the money to play at the level that the medium requires... In the case of television, I'll be frank, I think you need about $300 million at the minimum if you really want to be on TV and make it work. Okay, if you're a national brand, you really want to be on TV, $300 million. You really want to play, you know, in your market in billboards or something like that, it's probably going to be several million dollars. You really want to be on TV in your local market, realistically, that's probably half a million to a million dollars or more. Okay, you got to be able to do it often enough that the frequency and the intensity get you the result. It's not a case of there's incremental revenue for the amount of advertising you spend. You have to spend X number of dollars, whatever that is, in a media channel, and then you get a dollar of revenue. Okay, so for example, let's take television just very quickly. Let's say you spend, um, let's say you spend, you know, a hundred million in TV. Do you get one third the amount of revenue as if you spent 300 million in TV? No, actually you don't. You would get maybe one tenth the revenue. 
or one twentieth the revenue. Okay, so the curve is nonlinear in terms of how much money you have to spend in advertising before you get a decent ROI. So when you're advertising, it usually takes a boatload of cash and you got to be advertising at the level of sufficiency so that the media performs at its optimum level. And for most people who are building an online business, that's really not possible. So the good news is there's a really elegant solution to this problem, especially the frequency and intensity aspect of building a relationship. And that solution is email. Why is email the answer? Well, because you get to interact with that visitor three, five, 10, 20 times, whatever, before you introduce your offer. And over time, you can make them pay attention to you. And the email allows you to reconnect with some percentage of this audience on a recurring basis. Email is so valuable that the rule of thumb from multiple businesses that I've studied, every person on your email list is worth anywhere from $1 per email, deliverable email, per month, to the highest I've ever seen is $25 each. So if you want to make $100,000 a month, you need anywhere between 100,000 to 4,000 emails. Okay, that's a rough proxy rule of thumb. And this is the real secret of all these gurus you've ever met, you know, that are like, I make a gazillion dollars, you know. This is how they did it. They have real deep email lists. And so, you know, why? Why is email the answer? Having an email list let you fill these seats okay so when you're going to be working with the kingmakers and you're going to be introducing yourself to all these people the goal is to get their email at some point because it's better than social media where you have to pay for play even if you have a group even if you have a facebook page or whatnot facebook makes you pay to contact the people that you developed in your communities okay it's better than mass media where you have to keep this process going and it's even better than our, you know, RSS because you can interact with your subscribers. So let me just give you a very quick example as to how this all plays out. So for the sake of argument, let's say you've got 3,000 people on your email list. And let's say, you know, only about a third of them are paying any attention to you. So, you know, between 1,000, 900, 1,000, 1,200 people are paying attention to you. And if you really know your audience right? Because we talked about you got to know your audience, but let's say you really know your audience and you know exactly what's going to make them work, right? And so you decide to sell them the super duper product for 500 bucks, all right? Let's see how this plays out. So you have 1,200 people, and if you've done your homework properly, if you really understand what your audience wants and you really have 1,200 fans, about 10% of those people should be paying attention to your offer and be interested in it. Now, on a cold list, okay, it might be as low as 1%. The best I've ever seen is 10%. So for this example, we're going to presume 10% because it makes the math easy. So out of 1,200 people, 120 people buy your $500 item, and you just made $60,000. Now, some caveats, right? Generally, you know, you need lists bigger than this. You don't generally have conversion rates of 10%, etc., etc. et cetera. Okay, this is a hypothetical situation. I'm not saying this is what you can do. But I know for a fact this is how most of the top people, that they're making their money. All right? They offer products and services based on the understanding of the needs of their audience. I'll even talk about a little bit about how they figure that out. And they offer it to them via email after they've built this relationship. And it's this constant uh, circle of giving and offering products and services for sale. And some percentage of this list says yes. Okay. So to a certain extent, it's kind of a game of numbers. 
this principle even has a name, okay? It's called the Thousand True Fans Principle, which was a theory about how to build online commerce postulated by Kevin Kelly. That's a picture of him. He's got, like, you know, this amazing, like, Amish beard. Uh, and he's the founder and executive editor of Wired Magazine. And what Kelly pointed out was this, you know, if you had a thousand fans and the lifetime value of those fans each were a hundred bucks a year, then you could make a six-figure salary, which is a threshold that many people that are working online, for them, that's kind of a milestone threshold, okay? So if you take what Kevin Kelly's telling us, the whole traffic, 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 traffic strategy isn't necessarily required, okay? A thousand people paying attention to you is considerably easier than a hundred million people paying attention to you. And so the goal in building this audience is to build an audience of true fans, okay? People who really pay attention to what you do. And when Kelly made this observation, okay, he was trying to speak primarily to freelancers and artists, okay? But the reality is, is it works for nearly anyone, and depending on what your lifetime value per customer really is, whatever number you want to achieve, you can figure out roughly, well, how many people do I got to get to buy into that in order for me to achieve that revenue point? So if you find 10,000 fans who give you a hundred bucks, well, you can make a million dollars. And if you find a million fans that only give you a dollar each, well, you can make a million dollars. Okay, so it's a, it's a flexible kind of uh, barrier or frontier predicated on lifetime value of the customer combined with how many of them can you find. And so for you, you don't necessarily need a hundred kabillion people per month in traffic in order to be successful. You need a base of true fans. But, you know, true fans, it ain't love at first sight. Okay? That's not how a fan's made. Nobody looks at your stuff and goes, holy crap, that's for me. Okay? Nobody watches one football game and goes, holy crap, this is the team for me forever. And so... You know, again, I do a lot of research um, outside of digital marketing as well, right? I'm engaged outside of digital marketing. And for me, the guys who really kind of nailed this, you know, how much interaction does it take to become a fan, oddly enough, is Netflix, which has been an ongoing social experiment. And so Netflix has done all this research on what it takes to make a true fan of a television show, right? Because they've taken all these old, you know, shows and binging, right? They've created this verb of binging in terms of binge watching, right? And so since Netflix can watch everything that you do, they can take that information in the aggregate and they've done a lot of research about, well, what does it take to introduce a new show? And it's not necessarily new in terms of the show's new, I mean, they're introducing old shows from the 70s and 80s and 90s, but they're introducing them to a new audience. And so they're like, okay, well, what does it take if you take new content, you put it in front of a person? In the aggregate, what does it take to make that person a fan? And what they found was is that they needed to watch at least three episodes, and sometimes as many as six, before they committed to binge watch sometimes hundreds of more episodes. And Netflix was so stunned by this that Ted uh, Sarandos, who's the chief creative officer for Netflix, he gave this uh, speech in NAB, and here's NAB is the National Association of Broadcasters. He gave this speech in NAB, and he said, Given the precious nature of primetime slants on traditional TV, a series pilot, right, the first show, is arguably the most important in the life of the show. However, our research shows that more than 20 shows across 16 markets, we found that no one was ever hooked on the pilot. In other words, it's not love at first sight. This gives us confidence that we, uh, I'm sorry, this gives us confidence that giving our members all the episodes at once is more aligned with how fans are made. All right, again, Ted Sarandos, Chief Content Officer for Netflix. 
that's pretty crucial. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to just drop the mic on this issue and go, look, enough said. You got to get their email because you're going to need three, five, ten connections before they're going to pay attention to you, before they're going to get hooked. And I don't know any other mechanism online that does that. So, okay, how the heck are we getting all these emails? Where are we going to find all these fans? Well, Home Depot. <laughs> Just kidding. It's amazing. I was at Home Depot this weekend. They got like 80 zillion freaking ceiling fans. It's amazing. But, okay, for this guy, Mr. King of Thrones, guess who has your fans? He does. You need to find people, right? Well, guess who has people? Kingmakers. And that's why we have con connections with them. That's why I said they were important in the first part of this guide. They're the ones that already have the attention of an audience. And here's the thing. While attention is scarce, it's not necessarily indivisible. Okay, so what that means is that people will often pay attention to more than one person simultaneously in a given area. I remember one year, uh, A Bug's Life and Ants came out in the same year, right? So it's, it's two movies about bugs, basically, right? One was uh, Disney Pixar, the other one um, was uh, uh, DreamWorks, okay? And so you'd think, well, geez, there's only really one room, you know, there's only room for one movie about bugs in the marketplace, right? Well, no, wrong. People went and saw both. That's kind of what happens in terms of content. Now, it's not infinitely indivisible, and it's not infinitely divisible. Generally, on average, people are going to pay attention to anywhere between three to ten people in a given niche. So your job is to kind of weave your way in there, all right? And that's why the kingmakers are so important. That's why you got to start with them. That's why your best content's actually going to be for somebody else. So I've done a lot of research on this, and I've come up with 12 strategies that I can point to people that, you know, people having used them successfully in order to build their audience. All of them work, but not all of them work for everyone all the time, okay? Only about five strategies do that. And there are two that I think kind of universally work regardless of what niche you're in or, you know, where you are in terms of building an audience. And since this guide is aimed at a rather broad audience, I want to talk about just those two, okay? And the first is podcasting. And the second is guest blogging. So podcasting. Podcasting has gone from being uh, a curiosity to being mainstream to being a curiosity to now back to being mainstream. More and more podcasting is becoming available to people via their smartphones. And I can tell you that... Um, probably within the next 36 to 48 months, you're going to see more and more integration between smartphone and uh, car radio. And it wouldn't surprise me in the near future to see internet radio and or podcasting directly to your vehicle at some point in the near future. And podcasting probably is the future of what radio is going to look like. It's going to be on-demand radio. That's what podcasting essentially is, okay? And so podcasting is a really great medium for really two key issues, okay? The first is, like we're talking now, it's just you and I, right? It's a singular activity, and you can just listen to me, and we, you know, experience things together, and we go on this journey together, and it, there's a high degree of intimacy and, and a high degree of intensity, Okay, the other thing with podcasting is, is that you can increase frequency. So for me, you know, email is kind of number one in terms of, of creating connections. Podcasting for me is number two. Okay, 
Uh, the problem I have with podcasting is, is that you have to come to me. Okay. So I don't get to initiate the con the contact, but in terms of proximity, in terms of intensity, in terms of duration, in terms of frequency, it's got a lot of the good things that we like. Okay. Um, and so one way to get access to these kingmakers is to be on their podcast or to interview them for your podcast that you'll create. This is not a presentation about podcasting. Uh, definitely you can contact me and we can we can talk about that if you're interested. But um, those are really kind of the two mechanisms that most people use. So they either interview people for their own podcast or they get interviewed. Now, there's a lot of benefits to doing this, okay? You know, really, though, it gives you three things. It builds a more meaningful connection with your kingmaker, okay? They're going to remember who you are, and, you know, if you haven't read this book, I suggest getting it via audiobook or reading it or getting the Cliff Notes version of it. It's called Influence by Robert Cialdini, okay? And it talks about basically how to get people to do what you want, uh, and one of the things that Cialdini talks about is essentially the process of reciprocation. And podcast interviews get to build this bridge of reciprocation because you're helping to promote the, the kingmaker, and so the kingmaker is going to help promote you. All right. So it builds a more meaningful connection with your kingmaker. Okay? It helps establish credibility with the people who will listen to the podcast. Okay, and you actually start building a repository of content, which you are going to need later. Okay, now you'll see, you know, remember I talked about how you got to do your content, um, you know, on somebody else's platform. This one kind of breaks the rule, but kind of not. And I'll show you, I'll show you why in a minute here. Uh, but the, the, Idea is, though, you're still trying to get access to the Kingmaker's audience, and you're going to do it via radio, all right? And again, why? Well, we're going to interview the Kingmaker, and we're going to put it up on our site, which seems like it violates the rule, and you're going to have some sort of capture point, right? Some sort of email capture, okay? But here's where it doesn't violate the rule. So the Kingmaker, in promoting himself... You know, if you've built this relationship and he's and the person's willing to do it, they're going to be like, hey, I did this interview with so-and-so and I had a great time and here's the podcast link. And the kingmaker drives the traffic to you. So it's almost as good as guest blogging or something like that, okay? But they'll drive the traffic to you and they'll mention it in their podcast and their other things, et cetera, et cetera. The converse of this is if you go on the kingmaker show, well, then... You know, that's a little bit of a stronger mechanism, okay? And, uh, uh, you know, hey, it, that, that's really kind of more analogous to the Carson thing that I talked about in the first uh, video in this series, right? So, you know, he introduces you to his audience, and then they're like, hey, you know, for more information, go and check out, you know, www.whatever.com, right? So... That is, in a nutshell, how this mechanism works, okay? But the second, the second one, which is also very um, effective, is guest blogging. Despite what you may have heard, I don't care what Matt Cutts says, guest blogging is not dead. You don't have to start small. And it can result in large audiences relatively quickly. Because people consume blog content way more than they consume podcasting. Okay, so if you, you know, and you can write for Huffington Post or New York Times or the Chicago Tribune or, you know, Fortune Magazine or whatever, you can get a relatively large audience pretty quickly. Now, you know, let's talk about selecting your guest blogging venues for a moment because that actually really matters. Okay. 
Don't waste your time chasing the superstar blogs with no real connection to your ideal audience. You got to really, again, comes back to knowing your audience. You have to know what they read. Now, if there's a superstar blog that's in the sweet spot of your audience, then yeah, you better bet that's where you want to start. But sometimes people just chase big numbers. I want to be on Huffington Post. Okay, so like for me, okay, I do primarily marketing. Does Huffington Post really help me? No. You know, let me tell you, tell you a genuine story. I wrote this article on LinkedIn called The uh, Improbable Success of Ricky Gervais. Ricky Gervais actually saw the piece. He liked it. Liked it so much, it's still on the front page of his website, as a matter of fact. Okay, sent me gazillions of people in terms of traffic. All right? I still get traffic from them. And... Uh, none of those people are particularly interested in what I do. So the traffic's kind of wasted. All right? So don't waste your time just chasing superstars. You got to find the right kingmakers with respect to your audience. Second thing, you got to put aside your own pride and your own desires and understand it ain't about what you want but whatever the editor of that guest blog wants, and more importantly, what that blog's audience wants. So you may have to change how you write. You may have to change um, how you present ideas. But uh, you got to write for them, you know? So you can't just take whatever is your, you know, your, your shtick and just say, well, here it is. You're not going to get very, you know, far with that strategy. And what you do is you pitch your ideas and you wait for buy-in. And done right, it works almost every time. And this presentation isn't going to cover that. But um, I pitch ideas and then I write them. I don't write anything in advance because it's just too damn hard. Um, But if you know what you're doing and you know how to pitch uh, and you have the right contact information for a blog you can pretty much get buy-in every time. Because again, these guys need good content, okay? Let's talk about for a minute, like, what kind of blog, you know, is a good prototypical blog. I don't know what your niche is. I don't know what you're doing or anything else. But how do you know if the blog is good for your niche, okay? I look for blogs with high engagement. Generally, the proxy measure for that is comments. Okay. If there's a lot of comments per post, that suggests that that person's audience is highly engaged. Okay. Sharing is also a good measure. It's not quite as reliable as engagement. And I differ from other people who look at guest blogging in in that assessment. Um, but I guess I'd rather, you know, and I've done both, okay? Um, sharing gets you far and wide. Engagement actually gets you more emails since the goal is to get more emails and not necessarily, you know, more traffic. Um, focus on engagement, okay? And so some final issues, you know, the key in guest blogging, right for that audience Write for blogs that are going to give you credit. Usually they give you a bio line. And, you know, a good bio line is going to net you between 3 and 5% conversion rate. So, the, so you do need to pick blogs that have really decent traffic, okay, in terms of, of traffic size, because you're only going to get a sliver off the top. Uh, good news is, is those people are going to be highly interested. Do have a link to your website with your email trap which we're going to talk about next, and be helpful and be relevant and be giving yourself. you got to use all the lessons that I taught you in the first section of this. And then do interact with that blogger's audience respectfully, honestly, and be helpful. Okay. So I've given you these two mechanisms of where you can go. All right? So let's talk about how you're going to catch them. Will you walk into my parlor, said the spider to the fly. But first, Batman's got to slap you.
when you're starting out, content is not your focus. So stop writing. Whatever you're writing for yourself, stop it. Getting audience members is your focus. And so whatever your website is now, unless you already have an audience and unless you're already getting a lot of interaction with that content, whatever you have now isn't really useful. So you're probably going to need a set of landing pages and not really a website at this stage. The goal is we got to get people talking, interacting. We're getting emails. We're going to do most of our conversation offline in terms of off the web. It's going to be on email. What we're trying to do is get people to trust us because we're likable and trustworthy and we understand the needs of our audience. And so what that means usually are landing pages of some kind that deal with very discrete, specific needs of the audience. And again, this is why you got to know who they are. Okay. And whatever you're using for software, this is not really a discussion about, you know, how to build landing pages or software or whatnot. There are a bunch of them out there. There's lead pages, there's opt-in monster, there's, um, you know, thrive themes, there's, you know, new rainmaker. There's a whole bunch of different like conversion platforms out there. But I want to talk real briefly about like what these pages need to look like, okay? And there's a couple of different ways to go about it. But for most of you, you know, what you need is something that looks like this. Now, this is for a book, right? And this is from Lead Pages, but it's it's simple, okay? Here's the big takeaway and it's click to subscribe and then you're going to get a chapter of the book and, you know, there's not all this conversation necessarily. Now, if you'll notice when you came into this funnel, I had what was called a long copy close. I'll get to that in a little bit. But for most people, this type of a landing page where it's like good headline, benefit up front, click here to get more cowbell. That's what is the key design of what a landing page looks like, okay? And so here it is again. You know, free report reveals, blah, 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 blah. Here's the three bullet points, and hey, do you want more cowbell? And look at these guys on the bottom, and man, they got more cowbell, and their lives were changed forever. Okay, it's very focused. It's an ad. Landing pages are ads. So if you don't know how to write an ad, then you have to study how do you write an ad? Okay. And the two guys that I'd study, one would be John Caples, and the other guy would be David Ogilvy. They both basically did copy ads for a living. As you get more um, well known, your ad can be more simple because brand starts to carry you a little bit. Here's lead pages. Free report reveals the five secrets, blah, blah, blah. I love the headlines. You know, it's always the five this or the 22 ways that or whatever. Personally, I don't write that way, all right? Um, I know my audience pretty well, and I also know that um, they're skeptical, okay? Uh, and so I can't just be like, hey, would you like to know the 22 secrets to blah, blah, blah? You know, they, they're like, look, go away, okay? I mean, that's how I got you. Is not by writing that way, all right? But simple graphics, simple, strong headline, download the report, download this, let's get connected, right? I mean, it's, it's like, you know, I if you're married or not, you know, think about when you weren't married, you know, you, you can't close the deal on a single encounter, right? That's not how relationships are made. Okay. You got to have an opening, um, uh, offer. And that's essentially what these landing pages are about, you know, and we want people to just get talking about it. You need to make an, a mental impact. Okay. The point of the landing page is you're going to be singularly focused, hopefully on what that 3 a.m. need is. And you're going to be genuine in delivering value. And you need to have a unique voice. 
You can't just copy other people's stuff, okay? Even if plagiarism worked, which it doesn't, but even if it did, you know, you, you can't just impersonate somebody else, okay? And your headlines got to get their attention and you got to get them excited about it. And, you know, honestly, once they get whatever it is you've decided to trade for their email, they better look like this guy. I can't tell you the number of crappy downloads that I've made. But I remember every one that was good. Okay. So I bucked the trend of most of these guys that are like, oh, hey, you know, just throw whatever shit together and, you know, get their email. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't do that. They got to be like, wow, can I have more? I want more cowbell. It's tough. It's a risk. You could really pour yourself into something, but, you know, we're trying to build long-term relationships. So you want them looking like this dog. And so then, well, now what? So I got them all excited, right? Engage. That's what we do now. So, some people don't like this this chapter. This is close to the final chapter, but, um, you know, I, I'll just get into it, okay? Some people just don't like the topic or the, the, the headline, you know, love for sale. But, you know, we we're, we're really are trying to, 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 to make this relationship, okay? And I'll tell you, there's a lot more in common between advertising and dating than you might think, all right? And I don't know if you liked Mad Men or not, all right? Now, uh, I did. I didn't like the, you know, it's not really a show about advertising. <laughs> it's a soap opera. But I really did like the various characters and whatnot and definitely have encountered a lot of those people in my in my career. My favorite guy was Roger. I do business with Roger, okay? And Roger's like, don't you love the chase? Sometimes it doesn't work out, but those are the stakes. And when it does work out, it's like having that first cigarette. Your head gets all dizzy, your heart pounds, and your knees go weak. Okay? That's kind of what we're doing here. Roger's my favorite character. Is he a perfect guy? Hardly. Okay, he's a womanizer. <laughs> he's a misogynist. He's a drunk. You know, he's got questionable ethics at times. All right. But what I liked about Roger, okay, and what Roger's truth to me was, is that relationships are the key to making business work. And relationships are built on respect and trust and, yes, even love. And so, you know, again, this may make you uncomfortable, but. You know, you don't go up to somebody and ask if they want to have sex on a first encounter, okay? You might get some yeses from that. You got to ask a lot of people, okay, before you're going to get some yeses. Because even the most willing among us generally need a bit of romance. And that's true in business as well. So before you go and break out the, the whiskey... What I'm asking you to do is to start engaging them in a way that builds a dialogue, okay? And that means you don't immediately sell them as soon as you get them on your list. God, this happens to me all the time on LinkedIn. Hey, can I connect to you? Yeah, sure. So I say yes, and then boom, man, their first email to me is, would you like to buy my advertising management platform or whatever the heck it is? It means you got to have a real interest in them. There's got to be some true empathy there before they're going to trust you. And that means you got to give of yourself again. And you got to remember, right? We talked about this in the first section. They want to be understood. They want to be respected. And yes, they even want to be entertained. Okay. So what are you going to share with these people after you get them in your 
Uh, you can share with them the interviews you do on your podcast because you're going to be talking about the things they care about. You can share with them articles you come across. You can share with them new products and vendors you come across. You can make new guides for them. You can create videos and podcasts or share others of their podcasts and their videos talking about the issues your audience cares about. Your thoughts and insights could be helpful for them. Okay, I get this one email every day. I think it's close to every day from Chris Brogan. And he's very gregarious, honest guy. And so he's like, hey, here's what I'm thinking about today. Um, and here's some conclusions I've drawn. And, you know, maybe they'll help you too. He doesn't ask for the sale. You know, he only asks for the sale, I'd say, about once every three weeks where he's got something he's selling. Most of the time, he's just talking. And so you're going to keep doing this until your list hits a thousand people or more, okay? And some fun things begin to happen when you get to that level. You can start asking them for help. So what are you struggling with? And how can I better serve you? And if I had a magic wand to go, this is my favorite question. And feel free to email me at brian at clickify.com with your answer. If I had a magic wand that could grant your wish, business-wise... What would it be? And your audience will start telling you what they want to see next. And you're going to start fine-tuning your content. Okay? So, my commandment to you, after you've gotten their email, is channel your inner Sterling. It's about relationships. So, let's talk about this process, right? You're going to know your audience. You're going to find your kingmakers. You're going to take your thing out on tour. You're going to uh, be guest posting and guest podcasting and getting their emails and engaging them. Okay, that's not going to get you a thousand people right out of the bat. So you're going to lather, rinse, repeat. And because when I put this, when they put this training together, one of the questions I got asked was, so, you know, how do I get to the thousand? How does this work? All right. And that's a, that's a fair question. And so, you know, essentially it's, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. So when you start with zero, what's this plan look like? Well, you're going to need to find these influencers and these editors, and you're going to need to produce content and your content needs to be really good and you're going to get attribution and then you're going to get, you know, traffic to your landing page and you're going to convert more of them and your in first impression incentive or bribe to subscribe or whatever you want to call it is going to imprint on that visitor and then you're going to start a dialogue, okay? And this is going to happen over and over and over. Okay, so it's more blogs, more podcasts, more interviews and interviewing, more engagement, more content. You know, so figure really to get this working, you're going to need to do two to three major venues a month for six months or longer. Okay, 20 to 30 places. It's kind of like making a fire. All right, I don't know if you've ever made a fire from nothing, but there's a lot of effort at the beginning. Okay, whether you're using a bow method or whether or not you're rubbing the, you know, the sticks together against a strike plate or whatever, you got to rub like crazy to get just a few hot embers. Okay, and initially the process from zero to 500 people, it's a grind. I am not going to lie to you. Okay, from 500 to 1,000 gets a little better. And after 1,000 people, it starts to kind of pick up on its own. Okay, and... You know, initially, it's like this, okay? It, it, this is the hockey stick, right? So, and these are fictitious numbers, by the way, but this is really just meant to kind of give you a, a visual sense of what happens. So, you know, it's going to be incremental, 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 and then, you know, at some level, it's going to start to kind of propagate, okay? And it's going to go nonlinear. And so in this, you know, I've circled kind of the nonlinear part. And then the next thing that happens is you might get a plateau and it goes linear again. Okay. And when that happens, you know, you got to reevaluate. Are you, 
hitting the right blogs? Are your, you know, are you, are, is your content pushing the discussion, right? You know, are you encouraging people to share and, you know, connect and everything, right? And then, you know, you, you go through this process and it goes not, you know, it goes linear again. And then, you know, you may be linear for a long period of time. Okay, and that's okay, you know, and then it may spike again. <coughs> Excuse me, it may spike again. And you're going to have these plateaus and spikes and plateaus and spikes and, you know, a lot of it is you got to grind it out until you get to the level that you're comfortable with launching whatever your, you know, main... Uh, uh, um, monetization mechanism is going to be. And I'm not going to discuss that in this presentation. But this is what audience building looks like in the nitty gritty of it. It goes in fits and starts and it's non-linear and sometimes it jumps like crazy and sometimes it goes flat and sometimes it jumps again. And, you know, so it's going to be all over the place. It's unpredictable. Some things you may write hockey stick and other things go flat i'll tell you i didn't think the two pieces that got me over three hundred thousand people reading them that those would be the two everyone would like but you know don't expect it's gonna hockey stick right out of the gate but it will over time okay you will start to get some momentum on its own don't confuse subscriber with fan. You could have 5,000 subscribers and only 1,000 fans. All right? And there are ways to deal with that. It's not the, the, the point of this presentation to, to discuss that. But um, you got to really kind of get a sense of just who's engaged. And a lot of that you need to use your marketing software, your email marketing software, to look at open rates, look at engagement rates, and look at click rates. Combination of open and engagement rates are going to give you a sense of just how really fan-ish is your list. And honestly, you know, some people I know are very aggressive. If they haven't opened up an email from them in 90 days, they flush them off the list. Especially when you're paying per subscribers. If you're using MailChimp or Infusionsoft or something, Aweber or something like that, get rid of them. You're paying for, you know, BS. You know, so how are you going to know you're ready to stop the wash, rinse, repeat, you know, marketing cycle? When you come close to about 3,000 unique visitors a month to your site, or definitely by 5,000 a month, you, you got a nascent fire there. Okay, you've got some kindling, you've got a nascent fire, you might be able to throw some logs on it. When you ask your list questions or send them stuff and you get a 20 to 30 percent response rate, you've got some, you know, you've got some fire there. You might be able to throw bigger, bigger logs on. It. In short, it's a judgment call. You know, I've used this starting a fire analogy and that really is kind of what it looks like. But understand that, you know, you're going to be promoting yourself and you're going to be acquiring new fans and it's going to take time and effort and it's not going to happen overnight. And finally, you're going to get to a point where it's time for those fans to want to give back to you. And that's the goal in all of this. Then you're ready to start really making sales. So again, let's review. I know, you know, this, this, was, this was a haul, you know, uh, I get it. And, you know, let, let, let's, go, let's go through it really kind of, you know, piecemeal again. Email, 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 email. Seriously, did I mention email? If you don't have email, you don't have anything. It's really that simple. Where do you get the emails, right? Where does Jesse James find the money? In banks. Where are you going to find your emails and your audience members? With the kingmakers. 
two really simple ways to engage the kingmakers and start shifting some of their audience to you. Podcasting, guest blogging. For every piece of content you make for someone else, there's going to be links back to your site. And these little trails of breadcrumbs are going to lead the people who like what you have to say into your spider trap. And when they come to your site, you're going to exchange something of value for them, just like I did with you, right? I've given you these videos. I've given you over an hour and a half of my time by the time this is over. Because I want you to pay attention to me, and the only way I can think of to do that is to demonstrate I actually can help. And the purpose of the bribe, which is, you know, bribe to subscribe was a phrase that Brian Clark came up with, I think, okay? The ethical bribe, right? The bribe to subscribe. The purpose of the bribe is to demonstrate that you and the emailer recipient are meant to be together. It's love at first sight. You understand them better than they could have possibly imagined. They will wonder how they got along without you. And then I want you to channel your inner Sterling. Be Roger. Resist the temptation to produce stuff off the cuff or just ask for the sale. It is so hard for people to do. You know, they get that new they get that new person and it's like, sell, 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 sell. No. Stop. Be their friend. Build a relationship. When you build your list to a thousand people or more, you're going to watch it grow, but always be giving. And in your judgment, when that list reaches a critical size, then you'll start engaging them to tell you what to do next. And after that, you're going to ultimately start monetizing and getting back the investment. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. If you want to go back, look at the beginner guide. There's a link below. You can download this guide. I hope this has been entertaining for you. I hope it's been informative for you. I've enjoyed our time together. Um, please, if there are any questions, I'm happy to help. Reach out to me at brian at clickify.com. Again, I'm Brian Del Monte, and as always, thanks for your support. Hope to see you real soon. Good luck in building your audience.